I thank the agent of India for his statement, and I now invite Mr. Salve to take the floor. You have the floor. Honorable Mr. President and honorable members and judges of this court, I'm grateful for the privilege of appearing in this court once again and consider myself deeply honored at this opportunity to present India's case before you in this unfortunate matter relating to the life of an innocent Indian. This case, honorable Mr. President and members of the court, arises out of an application filed by India under Article 40, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of the Court, and Article 38 of the Rules, read along with Article 1 of the Optional Protocol concerning the compulsory settlement of disputes done at Vienna on 24th April 1963. The basis for the application on, on which India is pursuing the reliefs, which are articulated in its memorial, is an egregious violation of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963, which I shall be referring to as the Vienna Convention. The case is simple. Shorn of the irrelevancies sought to be injected, there are two broad issues that arise in this case. The first issue relates to the construction of the Vienna Convention, particularly Article 36 of the Convention and its application to the facts of the case. On this, the admitted position being that consular access was not granted. If Pakistan's strange defense of exclusion of such cases is not accepted, then it has to be found that Pakistan is an egregious breach of the Vienna Convention. The second relevant issue then is the relief to be granted in this case. The Charzo factory principle of restitutio in integrum is now the settled basis for relief. The only issue is whether past precedents of this court relating to a violation of the Vienna Convention, which granted relief by way of review and reconsideration, have laid down law, an inflexible rule, which has to be followed in all situations. India says that the court would have to decide whether the rule can apply to military courts like the Pakistan Military Court, and whether courts that do not rise to the standards of due process can be the repository of faith of the kind this court reposed in the American criminal justice system, in Avena and the Grand. Finding itself bereft of any substantive defense, Pakistan has rose, raised a host of issues which do not have any real relevance to these proceedings. On the issue of construction, Pakistan seeks to run one and only one defense for diverse reasons, it suggests that despite the plain language of Article 36, it stands jettisoned when the host state alleges espionage and national security. Its submissions run counter even to the authorities it chooses to cite. Pakistan runs unmeritorious defenses under the shepu of abuse of process, abuse of rights, of exterpi causa. It misstates the law it misreads commentaries. It relies on material that is not recognized as having any precedential value. And finally, having failed in its propaganda against India as a feeble attempt to counter global criticism of its role in cross-border terrorism, Pakistan seeks to raise issues such as India's refusal to allow it to indulge in a freewheeling inquiry into high functionaries without even disclosing the fundamental elements of the alleged offenses that are to be investigated and of passports that it allegedly has seized. It is India's case that none of these issues call for resolution and decision by this court. In the structure of my speech, I will first focus on the relevant issues. 
The relevant issues are the first, the construction of the Vienna Convention. The second is applying its language to the conduct of Pakistan, which leads us to the step of deciding the appropriate relief to be granted. I will also make submissions on the evolving jurisprudence in this area of the law and of the role of Article 36 in the rubric of due process. I will then deal with defenses run by Pakistan. A problem with the microphone. They have gone so, off. Now it's come on. Okay. Go ahead. I will resist the temptation, sir, to engage with the allegations being made as to the passport issue and the legal assistance issue beyond saying it would really be for this court to decide in the first instance whether to what extent Pakistan should be allowed to use these hearings as a platform for propaganda without establishing the legal relevance of this wanton allegations. Pakistan is obviously embarrassed to disclose the judgment given in the Jadav case the specific charges against him, the evidence against him. And while the statement of the advisor on foreign affairs to the Prime Minister's office of Pakistan makes a slew of allegations against Jadhav in relation to the incidents that date back to 2014-15, the Pakistan story has always been strong on rhetoric and blurry on facts. India therefore seeks relief by way of declaring that the trial by the military court in Pakistan in the facts and circumstances hopelessly fails to satisfy even minimum standards of due process. And being violative of Article 36 of the Vienna Convention, it should be declared unlawful. Jadav's continued custody without consular access should be declared unlawful. And amongst other things, considering the trauma to which he has been subjected for over three years, it would be in the interest of justice of making human rights a reality to direct his release. India invokes the jurisdiction of the court based on Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of the Court and Article 1 of the Optional Protocol. India and Pakistan have accepted the Vienna Convention and the Optional Protocol without any reservations. At the hearing for the request of provisional measures, Pakistan maintained that the jurisdiction of the court is excluded by a number of reservations in the party's declarations under Article 36, Paragraph 2 of the statute. It does not pursue this in the counter memorial. The optional protocol read with Article 36, Paragraph 1 confers jurisdiction upon the court to remedy the violations of the Vienna Convention. One of the defenses raised by Pakistan is that India's failure to explore the remedy of arbitration and conciliation under Article 2 and Article 3 of the optional protocol constitutes an abuse of process. India disagrees. This court in the Tehran case has held that Article 2 and Article 3 are not preconditions for the applicability of Article 1. On the facts of this case, this defense is facially farcical. I shall first set out the facts on which India claims that a violation has been established and indicate the areas of differences in their context. Pakistan asserts that an Indian national, Mr. Kulbhushan Sudhir Jadhav, was, quote, arrested, unquote, on 3rd March 2016. This is the publicly stated position taken by Pakistan. India claims that there is evidence to suggest he was abducted and found himself in the custody of Pakistan's security forces from at least the 3rd of March 2016. A statement made by the Honorable Minister for External Affairs in Parliament in India sets out India's position in the matter, and I shall refer to it in the chronology. For maintaining simplicity in my narrative, I shall use the word arrest without accepting the lawfulness of his detention. On 25th March 2016, India was informed of this so-called arrest when the Foreign Secretary raised the matter with the Indian High Commission in Islamabad. Pakistan issued a demarche indicate, making allegations of an illegal entry of an RAW officer 
and his alleged involvement in subversive activities. On that very day, in 25th March 2016, India sought consular access to Jadhav. Pakistan notified the P5 states of his arrest on that very day and created a 12-page document making allegations against India. It publicly aired a video that purported to be a recording of a so-called confession by Jadhav. Some significant facts emerge from this document produced by Pakistan. It states that security forces apprehended Jadhav. It's a fair assumption that he has continued since his detention in the custody of Pakistan's security forces. The document doesn't indicate the date of his apprehension. It mentions first week of March 2016. It states that, quote, the agent has confessed, unquote. It is obvious that soon after his arrest and in the custody of security forces, the confession was extracted. Information subsequently made available by Pakistan establishes that a first information report, the acronym for which in India and in Pakistan is FIR, under the Pakistan Code of Criminal Procedure 1898, was registered as late as 8 April 2016, and that under the <coughs> code marks the commence and under the code, the FIR marks the commencement of an investigation into a crime. But the confession obtained on 25th March 2016, before the FIR, was used as a propaganda measure, and its paraphrase finds place in the document circulated to the P5 countries. The document notes that this gentleman had been operating as a businessman in Chahbahar. It alleges Jadav crossed over from Iran to Baluchistan, and the document alleges he is a commander in the Indian Navy. He concludes, it concludes by making serious allegations against India of state-sponsored terrorism and of repeating its efforts of 1971 in Baluchistan. You will be surprised to find, despite all this, towards the end of their mem counter memorial, one of the defenses is that India has not established his nationality. There is no manner of doubt that Pakistan <coughs> was using this as a propaganda tool. Pakistan was bound to grant consular access without delay. India's request for access did not evoke any response. In para nine of its memorial, India asserts that Pakistan's conduct suggests that even Jadav was not informed of his right to consular access. And this is not contradicted in the counter memorial. On 30th March 16, India reminded Pakistan of its request for consular access and received no reply to its communication. 13 reminders were sent by India on various dates, and I will deal with them in my narrative. Pakistan acknowledges that as early as 30 March 2016, the Indian High Commission in Islamabad sent a note verbal to Pakistan's Minister of Foreign Affairs requesting consular access. Pakistan obviously had no difficulty in recognizing that the request related to Jadhav. India has no papers or authentic information of what happened in Pakistan. The information in public domain in relation to Jadhav's alleged arrest and trial was first found in the statement of Mr. Sartaj Aziz, made on 14th April 2017. The public announcement by the advisor to the Prime Minister sets out the steps that led to Jadhav's conviction in the award of a death sentence. Assuming them to be correct, my narrative will set out the course of events which follow. 8th April 2016, as I said, an FIR was allegedly registered. On 15th April 2016, Pakistan notified envoys of the members of the Arab League and of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, the ASEAN, who were quote unquote briefed after the registration of the FIR, Jadha was supposedly interrogated on 2nd May 2016 and again on 22nd May 2016. India sent a reminder, the first reminder for consular access on 6th May. The second reminder was sent on 10th June, the third reminder on 11th July. Proceedings appear to have continued in the meanwhile in Pakistan and on 12th July, a joint, in court, joint investigation team, unquote, was allegedly constituted. 
The steps taken by this so-called joint investigation team, including any further interrogation of Jadav, is not known. The press statement states that a, quote, confessional statement, unquote, was recorded under what is section 164 of the Pakistan Code of Criminal Procedure. In the meanwhile, India continued to remind Pakistan of its request for consular access and sent a fourth reminder on 26 July and a fifth reminder on 22nd August 2016. On 6 September 2016, it appears that a supplementary FIR was registered. Purportedly basing itself on the alleged confessional statement, the supplementary FIR named high functionaries in India, along with other persons, connected to smuggling syndicates on the allegation that these were Jadhav's, quote, handlers, organization, person, accomplices, and facilitators. On 21st September 2016, it appears that the first hearing of the field general court martial was held. On 24th September, the summary of evidence was recorded. India sent Pakistan a sixth reminder for consular access on 3rd November 2016. Even this received no reply. The next field general court martial proceedings appear to be held on 29th of November 2016. On 19th December 2016, India sent a seventh reminder to Pakistan for consular access. But there was again no response. On 2nd January 2017, the advisor to the Prime Minister, Mr. Sartaz Aziz, wrote to the Secretary General of the United Nations stating that the law enforcement agencies had apprehended an agent of Indian intelligence and that Jadav had made a confessional statement admitting his involvement in, quote, activities aimed at destabilizing Pakistan, unquote. It went on to add that the arrest of Kulbushan Jadav in his confessional statement has vindicated Pakistan's long-standing position that India is involved in activities at destabilizing Pakistan, unquote. It invites invited the United Nations and its bodies to, open quote, play their role in restraining India from these activities, unquote. On 23rd January 17, Pakistan sent a note verbal without seeking assistance in what they call the investigation of a case registered in the FIRs 6 of 2016 of 8th April and 22 of 2016 of 6 September in police station CTD Balochistan against Indian National. The letter of assistance that was attached stated that during the process of investigation and interrogation, Jadav had revealed the name of his so-called handlers, and it sought India's assistance in obtaining statements of high functionaries and other named officials of the Indian Naval Service. Surprisingly, it also sought assistance in obtaining the evidence of Jadav's wife. It sought assistance in coercive steps, such as searching Jadav's house, a certified record of his cell phone for the last 10 years, and certified copies of his bank accounts in his and his family's name. It attached a number of documents such as the first information report, etc. On 3rd February, India, by its note verbal, reminded Pakistan for the eighth time of its request to provide immediate consular access. It expressed concern over the continued denial of consular access and about Jadav's treatment in Pakistan custody. We said, especially about his coerced purported confession and the circumstances of his presence in Pakistan, which remain unexplained. It appears that the trial was concluded on 12th February 2017. India sent a ninth remand on 3rd March 2017 for consular access. On 21st March 2017, Pakistan replied to the communication of 3rd March, stating that the case for consular access to Indian National Kulbushan Jadav shall be considered in the light of India side's response to Pakistan's request for assistance in investigation process and early dispensation of justice. The court would have noticed that the trial already had concluded on 12th February 2017. On 31st March 2017, India replied to Pakistan's communication of 21st March 2017, pointing out that consular access would be an essential prerequisite to verify the facts and understand the circumstances of Jadav's presence in Pakistan, and for the 10th time requested immediate consular access. 
A press release was issued by the Inter Services Public Relations Pakistan on 10th April 2017, which announced that Jadav had been tried by the FGCM under the Pakistan Army Act and awarded the death sentence. And that on that day, the Chief of Army Staff had confirmed the death sentence awarded to him. It stated that, quote, the accused was provided with defending officer as per legal provisions, unquote. No lawyer. Pakistan, by its communication of 10th April 2017, responded to India's note verbal of 31st March 2017, repeating that the case for consular access shall be considered in the light of India's response to Pakistan's request for assistance in the investigation process, which was pending with the Indian side. India responded by its note verbal on the same date protesting that despite repeated requests, access had not been permitted and pointed out that in any event, the offer of consular access after his death sentence had been awarded and confirmed appeared farcical. A statement was made in the Indian Parliament by the Honorable External Affairs Minister on 11th April 2017, setting out the position of the government of India. The statement described him as a kidnapped Indian and a victim of a plan that seeks to cast aspersions on India to deflect international attention from Pakistan's well-known record of sponsoring and supporting terrorism. On 14th April 2017, the advisor to Pakistan's Prime Minister on Foreign Affairs, Mr. Sartaz Adij, issued his press statement. The statements of significance to the present case are as follows. First, he said, Jadav, quote, is serving commander of the Indian Na Navy and working with Indian intelligence agency, RAW, unquote, was apprehended on 3rd March 2016 after he illegally crossed over into Pakistan from the Saravan border in Iran. He said he was tried by the field court, field general court martial under section 59 of the Pakistan Army Act and under three of the official secret act. Jada was provided with a legal counsel in accordance with our ah, provisions of law, he said. He said Jadav confessed before a magistrate and the court that he was tasked by Indian intelligence agency, RAW, to plan, coordinate, organize espionage and sabotage activities aimed at destabilizing and waging war against Pakistan. Unsurprisingly, the court found Jadav guilty, as it has found many others. The espionage case against Jadav was tried by the FGCM and concluded under the Pakistan Army Act and the Official Secret Act. His sentence for espionage was endorsed on 10th April 2017. The steps which as per this press statement were taken to ensure transparency were, his confessional statement was recorded before a magistrate under 164 of the CRPC. This was of course much after his first confession had already been aired to the world. A law-qualified field officer was provided to defend him throughout the court proceedings. A statement of witnesses was recorded under oath in the presence of the accused. And in the court, Jadhav was allowed to ask questions from the witnesses. During the trial, a fully qualified law officer of the Judge Advocate General branch remained a part of the court. It went on to assert, and something which will be relevant for the final relief, that all political parties are unanimous that the award of death penalty awarded to a foreign spy is the correct decision. The whole nation is solidly united against any threat to Pakistan's security. On 14th April 2017, India sought consular access for the 14th time and also sought certified copies of charge sheet and the judgment of the military court. These have not ever been furnished by Pakistan. On 19th April 2017, the government of India again requested the government of Pakistan for handing over certified copies of the charge sheet proceedings of the court of inquiry. They were requested to share the procedure for appeal to the relevant court to facilitate the appointment of a defense lawyer, to facilitate the contact with the High Commissioner, High Commission of India in Islamabad, and to issue appropriate visas to family members to travel to Pakistan. For the 13th time, Pakistan was again requested to provide consular access. On 20th April 2017, a spokesperson for Pakistan held a press briefing in which he mentioned, quote, regarding consular access, we have said earlier also that we have a bilateral agreement on consular access. 
And according to Article 4, in all such cases, as the one of Commander Kolbushan, the request of the, this nature would be decided on the basis of merits." Unquote. This statement by the spokesperson is not reflected in any of the communications sent by Pakistan to India. On 26 April 2017, India handed over an appeal and a petition on behalf of the mother of Jadhav for being filed with the concerned authorities in Pakistan. On 27th April, the Honorable Minister, External Affairs Minister of India wrote to, a letter to the advisor to the Prime Minister of Pakistan requesting him for certified copies of the charge sheets, proceedings of the Court of Inquiry, summary of evidence, judge, judgment, etc. No reply was received to this letter. It was in these circumstances that India made its application on 8th May, making a request for indication of provisional measures. On 18th May, the court made the order indicating the provisional measures. On 19 June 17, India responded to the request for assistance in investigation. It pointed out that not only had Jadhav been denied consular access, but no credible evidence had been provided by Pakistan to show his involvement in any act of terrorism and his purported confession clearly appeared to be coerced. There were no details of the so-called trial being made available to India. Pakistan remind, India reminded Pakistan that it is the government of Pakistan which has not ratified the SAC Convention on Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters, 2008, and had not responded to initiatives in the past to conclude bilateral mutual legal assistance treaty. India accordingly returned the letter of 23rd January 2017. On 22nd June 17, a press release by Pakistan Inter Services Public Relations stated that the military appellate court had rejected Jadhav's appeal and Jadhav had made a mercy petition to the chief of army staff and if rejected, he could appeal to the Pakistan president for clemency. Yet another confessional video purportedly made in April 17 was also made public. On 30th August 17, Pakistan responded to the communication of 19th June by which the request for mutual legal assistance had been declined. Being faced with no mutual legal assistance treaty, resolution imposed overriding obligations on member states to afford one another the greatest measures of assistance in connection with criminal investigations. India continued to request for consular access by its letters of 20th September and 9th October. Pakistan's letter, however, considers India's regrettable stance, quote unquote, in the International Court of Justice, which ignored what they say repeated attempts by the government of Pakistan to provide an opportunity for the government of India to give evidence either exculpatory or inculpatory of Commander Jadhav. They failed to notice that Pakistan's misadventure in trying to publicly air the confession and raise the issue relating to his passport did not succeed in the court. The Pakistan letter requested, uh, stated that the request took the form that is internationally recognized. I will show you why this is plainly wrong in due course. The letter stated that some of the evidence underpinning the allegation has been made available to India. To be clear, Jadhav is unlikely to have been convicted and awarded the death sentence merely because he had, as alleged by Pakistan, a passport in a different name which would hide his identity. He was presumably found guilty of serious offenses which carried the death penalty as a punishment. Pakistan has steadfastly refused to disclose which specific events, which specific offenses related to which specific events in relation to which Jadav now stands convicted. The letter then audaciously states that it was, quote, incumbent upon the government of India to explain, unquote, the passport issue. And it closed by saying, open quote, to facilitate the Republic of India's compliance the request is provided again, unquote. On 26th October 2017, Pakistan wrote to India reiterating its stand, which it had taken in the communication of 30th August, but added, and I quote, without prejudice to the proceedings so far, government of Pakistan is prepared to consider 
any request for extradition that the government of India may make in the event that Commander Jadav is considered to be a criminal under the law of India. Unquote. India responded to Pakistan's offer for extradition. It pointed out by its communication of 11th December that Pakistan's communications of 30th August 17 and 26th October 2017 were again yet attempted. Propaganda in India was not possessed of any material which would give them to suspect that Jadav had committed any crime for which he could be tried in India. Pakistan offered to allow Jadav's family to visit him. The terms were agreed and the meeting was held on 25th December 2017. India was dismayed at the manner in which the meeting was conducted and wrote a letter on 27 December marking its protest at the violation in the letter and spirit of the understanding which had been arrived at in relation to the meeting. Pakistan responded to India's communication by its note verbal of 19 January 2018 on the same date Pakistan responded to India's communication of 27 December contesting some of the allegations made by India in relation to the meeting. India responded on 11th April 2018 to Pakistan's communication of 19th January 2018, pointing out that the passport which had allegedly recovered from Jadav was characterized as being patently false, and to investigate any such allegations, India would have to inquire into the circumstances in which the passport was recovered. Having finished with the factual narrative, I now move, sir, to the first issue of relevance, the construction of the Vienna Convention. Article 36 of the Vienna Convention is in language that admits of no ambiguity. Paragraph 1b of Article 36 requires the competent authorities of the receiving state, if requested by the national of a sending state, to inform the Council of Post of the sending state that a national of that state is arrested or committed to prison or to custody pending trial or is detained in any other manner. In addition to this right conferred upon the arrested national, paragraph 1c confers upon the sending state the right to have its consular officers visit a national of the sending state who is in prison, custody, or detention to converse and correspond with him and to arrange for his legal representation. Paragraph 2 of the treaty as places, as it were, above national laws for it mandates that while the rights to consular access shall be recognized in conformity with the laws and regulations of the receiving state, this is subject to the proviso that the laws and regulations must enable full effect to be given to the purposes for which the rights accorded under the article are intended. Article 31 of the Vienna Convention of the Law and Treaties, 1969, which I shall be referring to as the VCLT, requires that the treaty be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in the context and in the light of its object and purpose. The expression context is defined in Article 31, Paragraph 2, in relation to the Vienna Convention, it's India's case, that it is the text that would govern its construction. The first approach based on literal <coughs> interpretation of the language is the objective approach as against a subjective approach which searches for the elusive intent of the parties. The teleological approach is a wider perspective and emphasizes the object and purpose of the treaty as a black back cloth against which the treaty should be construed. These conflicting principles, the objective approach, the subjective approach, and the object and purpose approach have been codified in Articles 31 to 33 of the VCLT. I need labor this no more because the construction of Article 36 of the Vienna Convention is no longer res integra. <clears throat> In the Legrand case, this court construed Article 36 and held, and I quote, Article 36, paragraph 1b spells out the obligations of the receiving state has towards the detained person and the sending state. The clarity of these provisions, viewed in their context, admits of no doubt. It follows, as has been held on a number of occasions, that the court must apply these as they stand. In the 2004 Avena judgment, 
this court held that the court would recall that it has in any, in any event essential to have in mind the nature of the Vienna Convention. It lays down certain standards to be observed by all state parties with a view to the unimpeded conduct of consular relations, which, as the court observed in 1979, is so important in present-day international law in promoting development of friendly relations amongst nations. And, and I have taken the liberty of emphasizing this, ensuring protection and assistance for aliens resident in the territories of other states. Recognizing the duality of the protection afforded by Article 36, this court in para 40 of the Avena judgment said that, quote, it would further observe that the violations of the rights of the individuals under Article 36 may entail a violation of the rights of the sending state, and that the violations of the rights of the latter may entail a violation of the rights of the individual. Eric Bjorge in his book, The Evolutionary Interpretation of Treaties, cites Burman's community law and international law, which argues that VCLT and the rules when they were adopted in 1969, and I quote, swept away at the same time all the supposed special tenets of interpretation that had enveloped the subject like cobwebs. And goes on to say, one is today most unlikely to see an international tribunal of repute deciding a disputed point of interpretation by reference to special styles of interpretation, such as a restrictive doctrine of interpretation or other supposed special doctrine thought to be specially applicable to particular types of cases. The jurisprudence of Article 36 of the Vienna Convention has evolved with the march of human rights and human rights jurisprudence at various levels. At the international level, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, is a major milestone in the articulation of principles that govern basic civil and political rights of mankind. The interpretation of Article 36 of the Vienna Convention must therefore be informed by the contemporaneous state of the law in relation to human rights and in relation to the protection of the rights of those accused of serious crimes. In the Iron Rhine arbitration, the tribunal interpreted Article 31, para 3C of the VCLT as not requiring an interpretation oblivious to all later legal developments. The tribunal went on to note that, and I quote, there is a general support amongst leading writers today for evolutive interpretation of treaties. Unquote. It cites the ninth edition of Oppenheim that, quote, notwithstanding the intertemporal rule, in some respects, the interpretation of a treaty's provisions cannot be divorced from developments in the law subsequent to its adoption. The concepts embodied in a treaty may not be static, but evolutionary. Much of Pakistan's interpretation based on the overarching, overarching right of a sovereign nation to protect itself against internal and external disruption is a restatement, ultimately, of the principle of sovereignty and is reminiscent of the restrictive rule. The tribunal in Iron Rhine cites from Free Zone and SS Wimbledon cases and extracts the latter from which the following passage in which the permanent court cautioned that it would nonetheless, and I quote, feel obliged to stop at the point where the so-called restrictive interpretation would be contrary to the plain terms of the article and would destroy what has clearly been granted. The Iron Rhine Tribunal goes on to hold that the restrictive interpretation thus has particularly little role to play in certain categories of treaties, such as, for example, human rights treaties. Indeed, some authors note that the principle has not been relied upon in recent jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals, and that its contemporary relevance is in fact doubted. Article 36 does not admit of any exceptions. Besides, it would erode <coughs> significantly the reach of the provisions if an exception is sought to be made as sought by Pakistan. Article 36 requires consular access to be given without delay upon arrest. Such access has to be given before the case is brought to trial. At the stage of arrest, there would merely be allegations of wrongdoing which are under investigation. If at this stage, on allegations leveled by the host state, it is relieved of the obligations under Article 36 
And if consular access is jettisoned, it would render Article 36 a dead letter. The more serious allegations, the greater the need for ensuring that an accused has full and meaningful right to defend himself against charges brought against him. To exclude the operation of Article 36 in matters of serious charges of terrorism that would fly in the face of criminal jurisprudence. There can be no doubt that Article 36 was engaged in the present case. An Indian was detained, purportedly arrested, a confession extracted, then he was tried and convicted by a military court, awarded death sentence. And all along, requests for consular access were re rejected. This, quite plainly, is an egregious breach of Article 36. Pakistan's fundamental approach, where it says that the Vienna Convention is not engaged in such cases, is erroneous. For it looks outside the treaty for state practice to support consular access, which we say is an irrelevant exercise. It fails to engage with the consequence of its statement that the issue of espionage was present to the minds of those who negotiated the Vienna Convention, and yet no exception was made to the Vienna Convention to deal with cases of espionage. India does not base its case on customary international law or on state practice, but on the plain language of Article 36. Pakistan asserts that the effect of the Cold War on the exercise of codification of international law cannot be overstated, but again fails to acknowledge that if despite this, no express reservation was made in Article 36 of the Vienna Convention for charges of esp espionage, it establishes that, unsurprisingly, States did not want a vital safeguard recognized in Article 36 to be a hostage to allegations of espionage made by the host state. The absence of such exceptions in the Vienna Convention is unsurprising because the fundamental principles of due process recognize that the more serious the charge, the greater the need for procedural safeguards. Besides, there are some basic rules that must prevail between civilized nations and cannot be displaced by unilateral allegations leveled by the receiving state. Recognizing that the needs of security and efficacy of investigation may require the receiving state to withhold the notification of arrest by a few days, the draftsmen of the treaty built in some play in the joints by using the phrase, open court, without undue delay, close quote. A state may be able to explain a few days gap between the arrest and the notification if time is spent bona fide in investigating matters relating to espionage before the sending state of the national is notified. It is one thing to explain the lapse of time between the arrest and the notification to the home state, and quite another to suggest that charges of espionage jettison Article 36. Pakistan courts Sir Arthur Watts QC in his authoritative commentary explaining the ILC draft convention. In his commentary, Sir Watts explains the manner in which the interests of a state in a criminal investigation were balanced with the right to consular access. In paragraph six, which is extracted, he st states, and I quote, the expression without undue delay used in paragraph 1b allows for cases where it is necessary to hold a person incommunicado for a period for the purposes of criminal investigation, close quote. The commentary explains how paragraph six, six accommodates the need of a state to converse uh, conduct investigations during which it may hold a person incommunicado. This would perhaps be unnecessary if serious allegations of espionage and terrorism would jettison Article 36. Pakistan draws attention to comments made by Mr. Tungkin, the chairman of the International Law Commission. While he was mentioning espionage cases, he suggested that it may be desirable that local authorities should not be obliged to inform the council. But the chairman remarked that if the commission went into the question whether cases of espionage should be made an exception to the whole principle of consular protection and communication with nationals would have to be reopened. The extracts suggest that the problems of espionage was very much on the table and yet no exception was made to such allegations in the language to Article 36. Pakistan brings up the issue of problems confronted in implementing the provisions of the Vienna Convention in the context of pleas for asylum and in situations of dual nationality. Both these also establish that the Vienna Convention is indeed the exhaustive rubric of consular access. It is invariably the provisions of the Vienna Convention that provide the basis for resolving situation. 
finding solutions consistent with the Convention. One of the matters brought up by Pakistan is an application of Article 36 to a person of dual nationality, which presents legal challenges, no doubt, with us sua generis, but they need not be explored in this case. Pakistan gives a series of examples, which in its assertion are historic and modern examples of espionage that states often operated on the footing that they were not entitled to or were not going to be able to gain access to the espionage agents when they had been captured. India submits that the material relied upon for what happened in those cases is hardly reliable, for it is wanting in relevant detail. The plain language of a treaty, if it is contrary to the conduct of states, cannot be whittled down by reference to state practice. A treaty, in fact, is set about at times to bring about uniformity in state practice. So even assuming that the conduct of states evincing a consistent conduct, which is sufficiently clear, documented so as to satisfy the rigorous standards of what constitutes state practice, it cannot alter the played language of a treaty. The random examples given by Pakistan in any case do not assist the court in coming to any such conclusion of state practice. On the contrary, recent instances of arrest by China and Russia, facts in public domain, of persons on allegations of espionage based on information in public domain show that the conduct of the receiving state was compliant with Article 36. These the court would find in the judges' folders at tab one and two. Pakistan in this misadventure <clears throat> does not push it to the point of suggesting that there is an established practice to show that consular access is invariably denied in such cases. Individual incidents can then at best establish that Pakistan may not be the only state which has violated Article 36 of the Vienna Convention or similar provisions and bilateral treaties that preceded the Vienna Convention. There is no material place that would establish that giving consular access prior to extracting a confession would have so imperiled its national security or so hampered the investigation that consular access was denied. There is no explanation for giving consular access after that also. And now move, sir to a discrete issue, the 2008 Bilateral Agreement. <clears throat> In no official communique to the Government of India has Pakistan ever suggested that consular access to Jadha was circumscribed by the 2008 Agreement. Apart from a reference in a press briefing by a spokesperson of Pakistan Government on 20th April 2017, the Bilateral Agreement of 2008 was never referred to, and rightly so. The question of consular access provided for under Article 36 is being circumscribed on account of provisions of a bilateral treaty does not arise. Article 36 is the provision of a multilateral treaty and bilateral treaties covering the same subject matter can be accommodated as long as, and I quote, they are treaties confirming or supplementing or extending or amplifying the provisions of the Vienna Convention. This is the clear language of Article 73 of the Vienna Convention. The 2008 agreement was entered into, and I quote, for furthering the objective of humane treatment of nationals of either country arrested, detained, or imprisoned in the uh, other country, and by which the two signatory states, India and Pakistan, agreed to certain measures. These included the release and repatriation of persons within one month of confirmation of their national status and the completion of their sentences. The agreement recognized that in the case of arrest, detention, or sentence made on political or security grounds, each side may examine the case on its own merits, and that in special cases which require, call for or require compassionate or humanitarian considerations, each side may exercise discretion subject to its laws and regulations to allow early release and repatriation of persons. India does not seek any early release or repatriation of Jadav as contemplated by the 2008 agreement. The existence of a bilateral agreement and some of the government to the assertion of rights to consular access under the Article 36 of the Vienna Convention. This is also consistent with Article 41 of the VCLT, which recognizes the principle 
that two or more parties could modify the terms of the treaty as long as the treaty permits such modification, or at least does not prohibit such modification, and that any such modification cannot relate to a provision, the derogation of which is incompatible with the effective execution of the object and purpose of the treaty as a whole. The Vienna Convention creates specific rights in favor of those states and in favor of nationals of sending states in relation to consular access, creates corresponding obligations upon receiving states that they arrest, detain, or try, and sentence nationals of other member states in a particular way. Bilateral treaties which create obligations can only supplement the provisions of the Vienna Convention. Bilateral treaties cannot modify these rights and the corresponding obligations which form the object and purpose of Article 36. There is nothing in the language of the 2008 treaty which would suggest that India or Pakistan ever intended to derogate from Article 36 of the Vienna Convention. But even if there were such language, it would yield to the provisions of the Vienna Convention. <coughs> Considering that India and Pakistan are neighbors, both on land and sea, where people who live in the border areas frequently stray into the other country and end up in custody, it was found necessary to have a bilateral agreement that could supplement the Vienna Convention. Thus, the matters covered in para subparagraphs 1, 3, 4, and 5 were agreed to. And these are not matters covered by the Vienna Convention. They supplement and extend the provisions of the Vienna Convention. Pakistan appears to rely on paragraphs 4 and 6. Neither of them suggest that they detract from the general provisions and the overarching protection of Article 36. The requirement that each government shall provide consular access within three months does not give an excuse to delay consular access. But even if it does apply as supplementing or amplifying, at the best, it only fixes an outer limit of three months in which consular access must be provided. Not necessary to decide the issue. Consular access has never been provided. Even if paragraph small Roman 4 of the 2008 agreement was to apply, Pakistan should have provided a substantial explanation for why it needed three months of providing consular access, and upon which it could have claimed that it has complied with treaty obligations. Even on the erroneous premise that paragraph 4 applies, Pakistan has not complied with the treaty obligation. But worse is that case of reliance on paragraph 6 of the bilateral agreement. The phrase, examine the case on its merits, makes apparent that it applies to the agreement to release and repatriate persons within one month of the confirmation of the national status and completion of the sentences. As an exception to this, India and Pakistan reserve the rights to examine on merits the release and repatriation of persons upon completion of their sentence, where the arrest, detention, or sentence was made on political or security grounds. Paragraph 6 of the 2008 agreement also calls for compassionate humanitarian considerations in which each side may exercise its discretion to allow early release and repatriation of persons. The focus of 2008 bilateral agreement in these paragraphs was upon the return of those arrested, tried, and convicted in the receiving state, being nationals of the other state. As I said, India and Pakistan have shared land and sea borders, and there are frequent occasions when nomads or fishermen stray across borders and are arrested. These agreements primarily sought to arrest problems arising out of these kind of situations. Judge Shigeru Oda's treaties relied upon by Pakistan deals with the contrast between what is now Article 30 of the VCLT and the Vienna Convention. 73, Article 73.2 of the Vienna Convention is cited as a provision which recognizes the right to supplement its provision by bilateral treaties, and I quote, which do not derogate, derogate from the obligations of the General Convention, unquote. The text of Article 30 sub Article 2 of the VCLT, according to the author of the treaties, goes far beyond mere confirmation of the legitimacy of bilateral agreement. And he argues that if 30 sub Article 2 were applied to the bilateral consular agreement, they would prevail over the Vienna Convention. This analysis of Article 73 is directly contrary to what Pakistan invites this court to hold in the present case. Clearly, it is Article 73.2, which is a part of the Vienna Convention that would apply, and not the general provisions of Article 30. India is not a party to the VCLT, 
while India accepts that a number of the principles incorporated in the VCLT are codification of the general principles of international law, and for that reason of relevance, a suggestion that Article 30 of the VCLT would override Article 73.2 of the Vienna Convention has only to be stated to be rejected. Pakistan states the point, I must confess, with a degree of ambivalence. It doesn't seem to gather the courage to suggest that Article 30 of the VCLT would override 73.2 of Vienna Convention. Instead, Pakistan claims that a bilateral agreement is a, and I quote two words they use, supplement and or amplification of Article 36. India generally agrees with this assertion, but points out that the premise is destructive of Pakistan's case on the interpretation it seeks to place on Para 6 of the bilateral treaty. Article 6 cannot destroy Article 36. Paragraph 6 cannot destroy Article 36. The point is as simple as that. The phrases political and national security in paragraph 6 are amorphous and indefinite in their import. If both countries can unilaterally decide upon and police the application of Article 36 to individual cases, Article 36 would have lost its meaning. Arrests on Trump's up, trumped up charges are frequently made by Pakistan. The present case is a textbook case of such conduct. All that Pakistan would then have to do to wriggle out of Article 36 is to add a ground that can provide a hook to later claim that political considerations, quote unquote, in the arrest, even if it does not show up in the final charges and conviction, was the basis for denying consular access. Pakistan may then well denounce Article 36 itself. Having finished my submission, sir, therefore, on the construction of Article 36 and the irrelevance of the 2008 bilateral agreement, I move now to an important point. Article 36 is a facet of due process. The obligations of states towards aliens features as a recurrent theme of international law in the evolution of the jurisprudence of international law. In Barcelona Traction Light and Power Company, this court expostulated the principle that <coughs> created obligations erga omnes upon the states. The court held that such obligations derive, for example, in contemporary international law from outlawing acts of aggression and genocide, as also from the principles and rules concerning the basic rights of the human person, including protection from slavery and racial discrimination. Some of the corresponding rights of protection have entered into the body of general law, and the example of the Convention on Preven <coughs> Prevention and Punishment of Genocide is referred to. Others are conferred by international instruments of a universal or a quasi-universal character. These words would perfectly apply to the Vienna Convention. The protection of human rights generally and specifically in the context of aliens has been a significant strand in the evolving jurisprudence of international law. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed and adopted in 1948 in the words of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is, and I quote, become a yardstick by which we measure right and wrong. It provides a foundation for a just and decent future for all and has given people everywhere a powerful tool in the fight against oppression, impunity, and affronts to human dignity. The principles incorporated which recognize the universality of human rights reflect contemporary understanding of what constitutes due process. <clears throat> the principles of recognition of human rights have also evolved into principles of international law binding on all states erga omnes. The observations of this court in Tehran case bear repetition. Wrongfully to deprive human beings of their freedom and to subject them to physical constraint in conditions of hardship is manifestly incompatible with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, as well as with the fundamental principles enunciated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Powerful words. 
This general principle would apply not merely to members of the diplomatic corps, but to all human beings, and in present context, to nationals of sending states. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which came into force on 23rd March 76 in the preamble states, the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and unalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Recognizing that these rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. It goes on to state that considering the obligations of states under the Charter of the United Nations to promote universal respect for an observance of human rights and freedoms, the parties agree upon the articles. Article 14 sets out what is recognized as the rights of a person in relation to determination of criminal charges. Honorable President and honorable members of the court, I strongly submit that the Vienna Convention is a powerful tool that ensures at the multilateral level, almost at a universal level, the facility of consular access to foreign nationals who have been put on trial in a foreign country. This is based on the recognition of the rights of a national of the sending state to put up a fair defense at the determination of criminal charges in the host state. And this becomes meaningful when he has the benefit of consular access in its various dimensions recognized in Article 36. One of the vital areas of human rights is the treatment of those accused of crimes. The principles of due process expressly recognized in the ICCPR must jurisprudentially be considered to be a universal obligation binding upon all states, erga omnes. Consular access to a national of a sending state charged with a crime in a sending state evolved as a practice and found codification in Article 36 at a time when human rights jurisprudence was in its incunabulum. It was recognized by those who wrote the treaty to be a right without exceptions. They went further and wrote the right not just in favor of the sending state and its consulate, but also in favor of the nationals of the sending state. With the universal acceptance of the right to a fair and an impartial trial, and the right to defend oneself against criminal charges, including the right to engage a lawyer of unknown's choice in a foreign country as a rudimentary rule of due process, Article 36 becomes a vital cog in the wheels of justice. As was said of the Geneva Convention by this court, so can it be said about the Vienna Convention, that in some respects, the principles enshrined were a development, and in other respects, no more than an expression of the fundamental principles of humanitarian law and diplomacy. These measures were designed to put in place an instrument essential for the effective cooperation in the international community and for enabling states, irrespective of their different <coughs> constitutional and social systems, to achieve mutual understandings to resolve their differences by peaceful means. In a judgment delivered in 2010 in the Diallo case, this court considered a challenge to the actions of the Democratic Republic of Congo in respect of detention and expulsion of the national of the Republic of Guinea in the backdrop of rights and the obligations under the ICCPR and the African Charter. This court also considered allegations of the violation of Article 36, Paragraph 1b of the Vienna Convention. In the context of Article 36, this court held that the provisions, as is clear from their very wording, are applicable to any deprivation of liberty of whatever kind, even outside the context of pursuing perpetrators of criminal offenses." Unquote. This is consistent with the absolute nature of the obligation, as also a fundamental principle of due process, that the greater the severity of a charge, the greater the need for punctilious compliance with procedural safeguards, and this is recognized as the elements of due process. This court in Diallo's case went on to say, and I quote, it is true, as the DRC has pointed out, that Article 13 of the Covenant provides for an exception 
to the right of an alien to submit his reasons where compelling reasons of national security, quote unquote, require otherwise. The respondent maintains that this was precisely the case here. However, he has not provided the court with any tangible information that might establish the existence of such, quote, compelling reasons, unquote. In principle, it is doubtless for the national authorities to consider reasons of public order that may justify the adoption of one police measure or the other. But when this involves setting aside an important procedural guarantee provided for by an international treaty, it cannot simply be left in the hands of the state in question to determine the circumstances, which exceptionally allow that guarantee to be set aside. The expulsion of a foreign national of a foreign state has serious consequences on his rights. But the trial of a national of a foreign state, and that too for serious consequences that result in the award of the capital punishment, have far greater consequences on the rights of the person. In the context of expulsion, the ICCPR recognized an express exception. Yet this court held that the state cannot self-certify compelling reasons of national security. The approach that the seriousness of the allegations justify the violation of procedural safeguards by which an accused can secure fair trial betrays a fundamental failure to understand the very basics of due process principles. Even when in relation to Article 13 of the ICCPR and Article 12 of the African Charter, both of which deal with expulsion of a national of another state, compliance with international law is to some extent dependent here on compliance with internal law. And this court read two safeguards. It held first that the applicable domestic law must itself be compatible with other requirements of the covenant of the African Charter. And secondly, an expulsion must not be arbitrary in nature, since protection against arbitrary treatment lies at the heart of the rights guaranteed by the international norms protecting human rights, in particular those set out in the two treaties applicable in this case. The overlay of human rights was sharply brought out. This court cited the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee established by the ICCPR and the interpretation of the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This is a recognition of the degree of cross-fertilization of jurisprudence and a testimony to the growing fabric of the law that has drawn strands from these diverse treaties, from the decisions of fora which administer those treaties, and from the basic principles of human rights jurisprudence. One very important strand of this fabric is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Its nomenclature itself establishes that it should be considered a principle ergo omnes. The, un, the inalienable rights recognized in 5, 9, and 10 are non-derogable. Article 5 provides nobody shall be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Article 9 provides that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. And Article 10 provides that everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal in determination of his rights and obligations of any criminal charge against him. The body of principles for the protection of all persons under any form of detention or imprisonment adopted by the General Assembly's Resolution 43 of 173 of 9th December recognizes consular access in paragraph 16. Paragraph 2 of principle 16 provides that if a detained or imprisoned person is a foreigner, he shall also be promptly informed of his right to communicate by appropriate means with the consular post or the diplomatic mission of the state of which he is a national, of which he is otherwise entitled to receive such communication, please mark the words, in accordance with international law. It considers consular access, communication to be in accordance with international law. I submit this resolution establishes 
that by 1988, Article 36 was assumed to have the stature of a principle of international law. The 1985 Declaration of the Human Rights of Individuals who are not nationals of the countries in which they live recognizes that Article 10 that an alien shall be free to communicate at any time to communicate with a consulate or diplomatic mission of the state of which he or she is a national. Article 36 has been interpreted and applied by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Mr. Salve. Uh, before you turn to the next aspect of your argument. Sorry, sir. Before you turn to the next aspect of your presentation. Yes. Uh, the time might have, might have come uh, for you to have some rest, first of all, I'm because you deserve it, and for the, for the court to observe a 10-minute coffee break. Thank you, sir. Okay, so the meeting, the sitting is adjourned.